much for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for spending your evening with us tonight for our first Urban Idea panel for this year, How We Win 2015 and Beyond. Urban Idea is an incubator for new ideas and approaches to urban and regional development from a progressive perspective. This is just the first of a series of forums this year so stay tuned for those. Um, I'm a member of the steering committee for Urban Idea, and I'm very happy to be moderating this event this evening. Um, by the way, I'm Diane Ruiz, co-founder of online multimedia platform, People Power Media. So we have a great lineup of community experts for discussion tonight. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you to the Bayanihan Community Center for hosting this event. Considering what we're talking about tonight, it's really the perfect place for this discussion. See, Bayanihan in my native um, language of Tagalog or Filipino refers to a spirit of communal unity or effort to achieve a particular objective. And what we're talking about tonight is how can we come together as a progressive community to achieve victory in 2015 and for long-term movements. We're not just talking about ballot measures and electoral politics. We're talking about building and sustaining a progressive agenda through the strengths in our communities that will translate into legislative victories in the immediate term as well as long-term support. First of all, um, who here has volunteered for the elections last year, either for a candidate or for a uh, proposition. Hands up. Great. So I'm sure this is a pretty politically savvy crowd, but I'll start, up, I'll start us off with some context of the situation here in San Francisco. And then I'll talk about the results of last November's 2014 elections. So a quick shout out to Mario, Mario Yudidia, I saw him earlier, uh, political coordinator for San Francisco Rising for helping me out. Uh, so, San Francisco, home to the fastest growing inequality gap in the U.S., a housing crisis that is known worldwide, longtime residents being pushed out from skyrocketing rents, no fault and Ella's evictions and gentrification. The city administration under Mayor Ed Lee is continuing the pro-market trickle-down remedies of past administrations. It's an administration that is bringing out the red carpet to welcome new industries with tax breaks, trans transportation privileges, and changes to zoning with little regard to the impacts to existing residents. And the Board of Supervisors is consistently unreliable with its minority progressive look. But in the true spirit of San Francisco, progressives are fighting back. Last year, Prop J passed, putting San Francisco's minimum wage on track to be the highest minimum wage in the country. Proposition G came out of a resurging tenant movement and a series of neighborhood then citywide, and then a citywide convention. Although Prop G lost, it's worth noting that the grassroots effort that came together to get the 100,000 votes in favor was outspent 12 to 1 in this race, including an over $800,000 contribution from the National Association of Realtors. Other notable measures was the passing of Prop C, which supports city funding for San Francisco's young people, and the passing of Prop K, so the housing balance legislation will look to maintain 32% to 50% affordable housing for low and moderate income residents. The biggest candidate race of the year was the Battle of the Davids. District 9 Supervisor David Compos going up against District 3 Supervisor David Chu to replace Assemblyman Tom Amiano in Sacramento. After a hard fought battle, Chu beat Compos by 2,600 and 25 votes. While Compost won the day of voting, a testament to their excellent GOTV drive, 
There were 22,000 more votes cast by vote by mail in the 17th Assembly District than were cast in person. So that, along with being outspent, were a couple deciding factors. Now, looking at this year, Mayor Lee is up for re-election. And there isn't a high-profile candidate running in opposition, with former Assemblyman Amiano and Senator Mark Leno both bowing out. So what will it mean for voter turnout, for negotiations for upcoming ballot measures, for the housing crisis? A few ballot measures we've already been talking about are a new housing bond and opposition to the Airbnb legislation. There are also moves being made around setting up progressive candidates for the supervisor races in 2016. So given all of that, what are we going to do this year and moving forward? What new political realities do we need to change or acknowledge? What have we been neglecting? What do we have to remember not to ignore as we shift our tactics? What can we do to build progressive movements when there isn't an election looming? We turn now to our panel. I'll go over in more detail about our esteemed panelists. Um, as they speak, but now a quick overview. Um, USF professor um, Corey Cook is going to give us a breakdown of his analysis of the last election, including demographics, and what about that tech vote? District 1 Supervisor Eric Marr will be talking about how to reach out to Westside voters. After Supervisor Marr, there will be Nate Albee, legislative aide to David Compos, and Nate also ran his election campaign for assembly. He's going to be talking about vote by mail and money and politics. And so we don't get too distracted by our shiny new, <laughs> shiny new tactics, Emily Lee from San Francisco Rising Action Fund will be talking about the work and investment that needs to happen in communities of color to build a progressive agenda. And in the same vein, organizer Maria Zemudio from Kazakhstan Just Cause will close us off by sharing a GOTV plan for the traditional progressive-based communities of color. So I'll be guiding the conversation, and there will also be plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, so you should all have a piece of paper underneath your seat to write questions down, um, and you'll just have to share pens. Um, so after each speaker, we're going to have five minutes of questions from the audience. Um, so while they're speaking, you're going to write down your questions and pass them up to the front. And so it's just like passing notes in class. It's not too distracting for the people up here. You're going to write down the question and pass it up. So we had some volunteers demonstrate this concept earlier. <laughs> Yeah. So while you're doing that, go ahead, introduce yourself to the people around you. If they, you know, tap on your shoulder, that's what they're doing, passing up their question. Great. Thank you. And this is Mike, he's going to be helping with the questions. So, um, everyone got that? You're going to pass the questions up. We're going to have five minutes of Q&A after each speaker. We're also going to have Q&A after everybody's done. So two opportunities for Q&A and one for each of our speakers tonight. So let's get started. Um, so we're going to start tonight with Professor Corey Cook. Um, Corey Cook is an associate professor of politics at the University of San Francisco and director of the Leo T. MacArthur Center for Public Service and the Common Good. His research and teaching interests are in urban and California politics and multiracial, multi-ethnic political coalitions. So, Professor Cook, tell us about the voting patterns of last year's elections. Um, hi, everybody. Um, first, just thank you for the invitation to be here and to be on such a distinguished panel. Uh, I actually brought 34 slides, <laughs> so I'm going to go, actually I'm going to go really quickly through a few of them just to let you know that they're available, I'm happy to, uh, just generally I'm a, I'm a data nerd, so I'm happy to make anything available that you see here, if there are other things you'd like, um, to make them available to you as also. So I'm gonna, just going to highlight some things that we know, and then really try to highlight a few key points that I think you might find, find useful. So if we can start to advance. 
Um, so this is uh, just to get a sense of how segregated San Francisco's electorate is. Um, and so what you see, so we've got on these maps is uh, voter, voter registration by race and ethnicity. Um, and so this is the um, precincts uh, that are coded by white, Caucasian. Uh, this is Asian and Pacific Islander. You can see the population in the, in the western part of the city, in the southeast part of the city. Um, this is Latino population, uh, which is, again, predictable mission. Uh, and, and the 11, and then this is African American population. And there's a giant um, shadow <laughs> mission, um, but trust me that there is um, something there as well. Was, we'll advance to the next, the next one. Uh, the next set are um, uh, by party. And this will shock everyone, I'm sure, to know that this is a heavily democratic city. So this is a precinct by, yeah, these are Democrats. Uh, these are Republicans. There are a couple here and here. Um, and then these are declined to state voters, which are interestingly, or, or no party registrants. Uh. OK, so this is turnout uh, in 2014. So this is the uh, turnout in 2014. And on the upper left, and again, I I'm, I'm, I'm wasn't anticipating this would be cut off. Uh, but in the upper left-hand corner, you have uh, regular voters. So that's for folks who, who regularly participate in elections. Um, so again, it maps pretty, pretty clearly that those who vote in five out of the last six elections are who voted in November of 2014. Uh, so it's, you know, this is a fairly common low turnout voter pattern uh, that we saw in this election. These are new voters. So these are folks, up, uh, the upper left-hand corner are the folks who, vote, who registered to vote uh, since the 2014 uh, year started. So the new voters as of January 2014. And the concentration, as you can imagine, is in the southeast part of the city. Um, and I'll show you some other data in a little bit about those voters. They're disproportionately likely to be white. They're disproportionately likely to be kind of state voters. But I'll show you some demographics about new registrants uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, these are new registrants. It bounces. These are the new registrants uh, since the presidential election. So these are people who vote, who registered to vote after November of 2012. Again, the concentration is primarily in the southeast. I'm sorry, in the, in the in the South Market area. But again, you see pockets. I mean, SF State is obviously one. USF is another pocket, but a lot of uh, where the new developments are in the in South Market area. Okay, so this is um, the Progressive Voter Index, which was created by uh, my colleague David, uh, first by Paul, by Rich DeLeon at San Francisco State. David Latterman also uses this. I've been using this a lot to explain voting patterns. And so I'll get very briefly through some of what happened in the last election, but a lot of the, the voting tracked pretty closely on the Progressive Voter Index. Uh, this is a, an index measure that uses votes on ballot measures to look at the uh, precincts relative to one another, which are the most progressive, which are the most moderate. So again, these are the most progressive precincts in the city. The lighter colors are the more moderate areas. OK, so just for fun to back up, so this is the 2011 election. Uh, and this is uh, Avalos voters plus Herrera voters first place votes. And this tracks almost identically on the Progressive Voter Index. The next is Ed Lee votes, which is damn near the inverse. Uh, again, I can show you the scatter plot, but again, it tracks very closely to progressive voters being uh, highly explainable <coughs> in a negative direction. And then the last one is um, Ed Lee minus Avalos and Herrera. So uh, this is ballots that had Ed Lee and not Avalos and Herrera, or ballots with Avalos and Herrera, not Ed Lee. Again, you see the concentration. The Ed Lee balloting is going to be in the uh, western, southeast part of the city. You get the, the more progressive areas, um, disproportionately preferred uh, Herrera and Avalos. Oh wow, now this is actually like the most important thing I was going to show you. You can't actually see any of it. So this is, um, this is what we know about the current election. This is based on the, the uh, voter file. And again, I, I'll just repeat that I'm happy to email this to anybody who's interested and happy to run other numbers that are useful. Um, so what this shows is in 2014, this is voter registration. Uh, so in 2014, the electorate was 60% white. So 2014 voter registration. So this is not the electorate. This is not a voter. This is who, who's registered to vote. So the electorate is 60% white, 24% Asian Pacific Islander, 10% Latino, 3.9% African American, and 1.2% other. Registered since January 2014 is 85.6% white, 7.9% Asian Pacific Islander, 4% Latino, 2.3% African American. Uh, if you look at registration back to those who registered after the presidential, back to the, um, the gubernatorial in 10, or registered since 2008, it starts to look more like the electorate. But more recent registrants, are very different than what San Francisco looked like before. 
Um, turnout by race and ethnicity, and I can, I'll show you the 2014 um, numbers. But the key is over here, actually, which, thank you, are regular voters. So these are voters who vote in five out of the last six elections. You get 62% white, 27% Asian and Pacific Islander, 6.8% Latino, 2.7% African American. So again, you can see the differential from, from population to registration to participation, regular participation in elections. This is voter registration by, by supervisorial district. So I have the changing, um, you know, the, the, how the population is changing in supervisorial districts. And the next one is um, race and ethnicity by supervisorial districts. So you can see, you know, Dig 10 and D11 are by far the most diverse in terms of registered voters. Uh, most of the other districts, the green bar are white voters, registered voters. Actually, these are actual voters in the 2014 election um, by, by district. So, you know, you can see that most of the supervisorial district white voters are a, a significant majority, except for in 10 and 11. And this is for previous years, so we'll just move on because it's a lot. Okay, so one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, I know, is um, the rise of absentee voters. So this is 1972, absentee voters, about 9% of the electorate. This is now. So absentee voters are now um, almost 70% of the electorate. The next one is, in, so this is state elections. Uh, the next one, um, and that was primary and general. You can see it goes up generally. Uh, the lower the turnout, the higher relatively uh, the proportion of the electorate that are absentee voters. That's not unexpected. This is um, municipal elections. Again, approaching 70% of voters in municipal elections vote absentee. Okay, so this is the Campos Chu vote. I know another, other people probably have maps of this. So I'm just going to go quickly to a couple of points that I want to make about what happened in the, in the race. Um, so this is um, the, the support for Compost and the support for Chu um, scattered against the progressive voter index. So this is Compost. Again, generally speaking, the more progressive the precinct, the higher the vote for, for supervisory uh, Compost. And obviously the converse is true. These are color-coded by supervisorial precincts. So you can find some areas where there's like seemingly out of alignment, which I'll get to a little bit in ballot measures. Okay, so I did a little bit of math on the, on the um, on the results. And what you find, and I'll, I'll just highlight the, the big stuff. Um, so Asian Pacific Islanders, this is a, a regress of the precinct voters. So the demography of the precinct voters and the outcomes in that precinct. So precincts with higher proportions of Asian Pacific Islander voters were far less likely to vote for supervisor votes. Um, precincts with higher proportions of Latino voters were more likely to vote. Um, it turns out that um, New voters turn out not to matter very much. Regular voters, well, one minute, oh wow, okay. Regular voters were, again, negatively correlated. So the higher the number of regular voters in a precinct, the worse the compost did. Um, one of the things that's happening now in, in, in elections is this top two primary thing. Um, my estimate is about 4% of that. So basically the swing in that election were Republican voters. I think that was the margin of victory of Republican voters. But there's an important thing to know, which is, there are these new category of voters that we know statewide as orphan voters. Those are voters who may be Democrats, but then have a ballot that are two Republicans. Or Republican voters have a ballot that has two Democrats. It turns out that actually a lot of those voters turn out to they, they roll off at higher rates. Actually, if you do the next one in particular. Um, so those voters are actually more likely to, to not vote, to roll off if they are of, of the same party. So Republican voters, the highest coefficient by far of those who did not, who cast a ballot, but did not vote in the Chu Compost race were precincts with a lot of Republicans in them. So even though they're used to voting for Democrats, typically in municipal elections, when they see a race that has two Republicans on it, statewide about 55% of voters don't vote if they don't have a party of their, of their own in the, in the race. So in, in a district like this one, about half the voters actually, Republican voters rolled off, but we know that Chu got a significant majority of those voters, and I think that's it's not exactly pretty close to the margin of victory. Um, I'm out of time completely. I haven't talked to anybody. Extension. About it. I've got an extension. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, okay, well, this is actually, let me just do a couple quick things. We'll just go really fast. So, if you could just um, put forward a couple. Okay, so I feel like Matt, let's go to the next one. So, this is um, Prop A. And, and, and part of the question was sort of, and this came up a lot after the election, is the analysis of who won the election. And of course, the mayor claims victory because everything that he supported won. And then yet you look at maps like this and everything the mayor favored won because progressive voters voted for it disproportionately. So it's sort of hard to say sort of which side won when you have like Prop A, 
the more progressive voters voted in favor of A. Um, if you go to click two more, which you could. Uh, this is Prop B. Similarly, you get more progressive voters are more likely to vote for Prop B. If you look at Prop C, again, voters um, disproportionately likely, again, the more progressive precincts voted in favor of C. And we can, just, we can actually do this all night. But the point being, um, in, in all these ballot measures, um, whether you're talking about you know, Prop G, the anti uh, uh, displacement, the um, anti speculation tax, if you're looking at K, the mayor's measure, if you're looking at um, the minimum wage increase, all those measures were disproportionately favored by progressive voters, which made very interesting then the analysis after the election of the mayor saying, everything I voted for passed, and then they passed because progressive voters voted for them. Um, so he claimed victory, which isn't probably surprising, um, but probably a lot of progressives claim victory too because the things they voted for passed. Um, so last thing about tech voters. Um, so, okay, so right now tech voters aren't yet a significant voting block in San Francisco. We don't know yet enough, and I'm hoping I'll know more in a couple of months. But basically, looking at the voter file, if you look at voters who are between, and we're sort of guessing here, right? So voters between roughly 24 and 35, uh, who are new registrants in the last year, who are living, their, their registration address is near Google bus lines. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing, right? This is the best you can do. Uh, who are living in addresses that turned over in terms of purchases that we've got in the last couple of years. And the next thing is they linked in each of the individual names and figure out where they work. But at least for that cut, so for those folks, it's about, in the voter file, about 10 to 15,000 voters. Wait, so it's about 10 to 15,000 voters. So it's significant. But if you look at the number of new registrants since uh, uh, in the last year, it's 100,000 voters. So tech is not yet participating. The, the, the assumption is they will, but again, at least according to the voter file, they aren't participating. And new registrants didn't vote at high rates. So a lot of folks who registered since January didn't vote in, in November. So there's still a looming change that's coming. So, with that, thank you. If anyone has any questions specifically for Professor Cook, um, please pass them up. Thank you. Not a, a lot of uh, the questions we'll have to get to to the end or for the other speakers. Um, oh, here's an easy one. What's your email address? <laughs> Um, so it's, it's C D Cook. So C is C is in Corey. C is in Dave. Uh, Cook number two at usfca.edu. Usfca South Florida beat us usf.edu. So we usfca.edu. Okay. One more time. Yeah, C D Cook. C D Cook two. Number two at usfca.edu. Again, I'm happy to email. I can post this. If there are places to post it. I get it. If you have interest in other sets of numbers, you got to play a lot with the voter file with election results. So I'm happy to send things to people if you're interested. Okay. And I'm sure we'll put the, put the slides up on the Urban Idea Facebook and website um, and event page on Facebook. So just uh, check those in the next week. Um, here's another question for you. Um, can you elaborate on the Republicans' margin of victory for two? So it's, 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 it's an educated guess, right? But, but ultimately, um, the final margin of the electorate was three points, yeah. Um, just under four, right? Just under 4.0. Um, and again, if you, you, have, you have sort of have to close one eye, right? Because the challenge is we don't actually get to look at people's ballots, unfortunately. Um, so we're guessing. Now, there's actually, the cool thing about ranked choice voting is we do get to look at people's ballots. And you can get a whole lot more about ranked choice elections. So I wish this was the right choice election because then we could actually look at individual votes. But um, we can't really look at people's votes, but we can look at who turned out, who voted. We can look at the composition by party of each individual precinct and do a lot of correlations to say, how did higher precincts with higher number of Republicans, how did they vote? And again, estimating roll-off, again, a large number, about 20 voters per precinct voted in the congressional race and didn't vote in the assembly race. The conventional race had a Democrat and Republican in it. The assembly race had two Democrats. So about 20 voters per precinct 
voted in the congressional race, voted in the presidential, I'm sorry, the, congr the gu gubernatorial, voted in the congressional, and then skipped the assembly race. The assumption is most of those folks, frankly, are Republicans who didn't want to vote, choose between two Democrats. So if you estimate roughly, again, about half of Republican voters did not vote in the assembly race, and you estimate based on how did David Chu do in precincts, based on the relative number of Republicans, it comes out to plus or minus about four points in the, pre in, the, in, the, um, in, that, in the district. So again, it's a guess, but it's, 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 it's within the margin of error, for sure. So, there are some questions about uh, the tech voters. Um, so, I think you, you already went over uh, how you narrow down um, tech voters. Um, and you're, you, know, you told me before that you're going to try and narrow that down even further um, to actually LinkedIn um, job files. Um, so, uh, I have a question about, did you say that 10 to 15 percent of tech workers voted or registered? Re registered. It's about half of those. Half of those who registered who are new registrants voted, so it's about half that number. Okay. And so we have a minute for this question. Uh, what were some of the reasons for lower than usual voter turnout for uh, Central Market, South of Market, and North of Market? Yes, I, 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 there are folks on this panel who are better able to answer that question than me. So I, I mean, I can have the answer, but others would be, okay. would, be, would be better. So I'll just save the rest of the questions for after. Um, we're, we're still going to have a Q and A. So let's move on to our next um, panel speaker, which is Supervisor Eric Marr. So. Supervisor Marr was elected in November 2008 to represent District 1, the Richmond District. In 2012, he was re-elected for a second term. He is also an elected member of the past and member and past vice chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party's Central Committee. Eric is a past director of the Northern California Coalition for Immigrant Rights and a longtime social justice activist with the Chinese Progressive Association and other grassroots organizations. As a public interest attorney, he served on the Human Rights Committee of the State Bar of California and the Civil Rights Committee of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. <coughs> Supervisor Marr will be talking to us about how progressives can reach out to Westside voters. Thank you, Diane. Um, let me first say that there's a tremendous um, resource of everyone in here that's had quite a bit of experience in many generations of movements. Um, I'm Eric Marr. I came out of the, um, the 80s as a radical student activist. Some of us were part of left organizations in the 70s and 80s, um, and really antagonistic towards electoral work. I think until the Rainbow Coalition campaigns of the 1984, which I um, jumped into, like a lot of my colleagues, um, and then in 88 as well, but Rainbow Coalition chapters as one model. I know there's some of us like Huli and others were part of the community congresses of the 70s in uh, neighborhood by neighborhood building a power and a voice for different neighborhoods as well. There were different times where some of us tried to form the San Francisco Progressive Alliance or the San Francisco um, People's Organization and different formations but my hope is that I don't become a Debbie Downer um, with what I'm going to say um, right now, and I move towards optimism that's to this side of the, um, the panel. Um, but progressives are getting our asses kicked, um, at not only in ballot initiatives, um, but also, like Prop G is kind of the best example, the um, anti-speculator tax, but also we're down to three, some people say four to five, at three to four progressives on the Board of Supervisors when we had a majority and could drive uh, an agenda in the past. But I'll just say that I think one of the reasons um, is a lack of infrastructure from the outside and a lack of communication and dialogue with that outside to the inside. And then even within the Board of Supervisors, the 11 of us, or even the, the four, three to four progressives, we don't communicate nearly enough and we're there's lots of egos and opportunism that, um, and not an outside organizational movement that's holding us accountable to work together for a common good. Um, I wanted to say that as a 
supervisor for one of the areas that Corey talked about that's a more moderate one. Though I will say that there are pockets of progressivism according to the uh, Progressive Voter Index. Um, but even when you overlay the Progressive Voter Index that Corey talked about with um, emerging progressive sentiments in communities of color, I think there's a lot of opportunity that's there. But in the Richmond, the inner Richmond where I live, um, there's clearly a different um, political character than the outer Richmond. But I think we shouldn't look at districts monolithically, or even in the Sunset District where a lot of the no on G and some of the conservatism voted, there's a strip of the, um, along the um, Ocean Beach area and um, the Great Highway where um, you have more progressivism. But I think as we look at electing progressives or even liberals that progressives can work closely with in um, tactical alliances at times, it's really important to look at the demographics, um, the progressive voter index, but overlaying it with communities of color and other communities that might not be represented by ballot initiatives that white progressives might vote on, but maybe communities of color might need to be communicated to differently. And I think what SF Rising and Oakland Rising are doing is really important. Um, as a supervisor from the west side as well, wow, I'm, I'm up to about three minutes already, so let me start to uh, say, as a supervisor on the west side, as a radical and a progressive, I have to be very careful about framing, and I guess I use the George Lakoff um, framing to make sure that the language that I use is not the language of my enemies, um, that it's language that is, um, is forward-looking and positive, not so much what I'm against, but what I'm for, but also it's language that it's hard to counter um, if you're for, and I'll just use one of the examples um, from Local Progress, one of the groups that supports a lot of progressive elected officials. Um, I'm for fair wages and fair markets, health security, retirement security, equal justice for all. It might sound like um, mealy-mouthed um, politician talk, but I think in my district when I get out there, um, I can't talk about at times what my politics really is if I have to engage my neighborhood as well. But I think on the west side there's tremendous um, potential, and Emily Lee, who did a lot of the work to re-elect me in 2012 overwhelmingly, um, with a mainstream firm, 50 plus one, but I think the SF Rising groups and many of the people in the room did a lot of work, even though you don't live in District 1, um, are the reason why I was reelected. But also we, I think, framed well, um, we targeted very carefully, and we won, I think, every single precinct with, except, with the exception of one precinct. But I think it shows that with real strategic efforts, but really it took the outside <laughs> Um, lots of the social justice organizations, housing justice, and people that were in the Richmond, but we also helped to mobilize a Richmond district that was more progressive. Um, we have an opportunity in districts 1, 3, 5, 9, and 11 to, to do this again. Um, I'm hoping that um, at least one of the candidates from District 1 will make a decision very soon so that um, the SF Rising um, Action Fund and others will be behind her and many others that are running. But I think it has to be not just looking district by district, but a citywide strategy. I also wanted to say, too, that um, I still think that for the Richmond District, the displacement crisis and the eviction crisis is the number one issue as we're facing seniors and families and everyone in fear of whether they're going to be able to stay in the Richmond. And I think that is the overarching. The character of neighborhoods um, and the fear of being pushed out of the Richmond or out of the city is kind of the big issue. Um, and I think it's very similar to many, many other neighborhoods, though I would frame it a little bit differently as I speak to Richmond District um, people. But I would say, too, that the creation of entities like SF Rising and Oakland Rising, but also the Progressive Voter Project during the Mac Gonzalez campaign emerged for a few years, but reproducing efforts to um, take advantage of the absentee voter upsurge um, but also ensuring that people continue to participate, not just election by election, but year to um, around year round as well. Um, I think building of the infrastructure for the outside is so critical. Ballot measures help to do that if you get the <coughs> signatures to place something on the ballot or you mobilize for it. So even though we lost with Prop G, the anti-speculator tax, it builds for the future, even in the more west side districts where it seemed to go heavily against G. But I think if we look at the data very carefully for what the tenant organizations and the movement did, um, it gives us an, um, a lot of places to really build off of. I just wanted to also say that I think the base building organizations, the social justice groups, 
um, and the progressive side of labor is really critical to be a part of that broader coalition to um, to ensure that we don't keep getting our asses kicked as progressives and that we move towards that inside and outside that's healthy and that there's good communication among um, the progressives on the super board of supervisors and new alliances with even others that um, may not be progressive on the board. And then even with the aides, um, so it's great to see um, that um, some of the aides from our offices getting together and communicating with, um, with the allies in the outside as well so that it's not just the uh, elected officials, but it's those that um, that um, do the work um, in our offices, but also the social justice groups and progressive labor and others that are building on the outside as well. But that's that's what I'll just share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Mark. Um, so there are some specific questions about. Um, different um, positions that you have, but uh, we'll, we'll try and get to those um, if you have time, but there are a lot of also um, a lot of questions related to Hello? Okay. a lot of questions related to um, this idea of uh, the progressive label. Um, is that um, not talking to people um, that are outside of what people might, you know, some people don't identify themselves as progressive, but they might lean towards pro uh, supporting um, things that progressives do support, um, but it, um, getting some feedback about that um, can be alienating for some people. Um, also that progressives may not um, uh, welcome outsiders. <laughs> okay, I'll try and yell, sometimes I'm soft-spoken, but uh, let me know. Uh, so some people are saying that they're um, feeling like outsiders. Um, is there a larger vision and message that people can um, get inspired by? So you're coming from a district where um, people don't really think of them as progressive, but you were able to be re -elect elected and then re-elected. Um, how, what sort of messages can you share to everyone um, that you made that happen? Um, yeah, that, I guess that's a really hard one. I, I try very hard when I'm with an audience that understands what um, being a progressive is. I, I'll use the term, or if we're talking um, radical socialists, others that are in the room will talk in a different language. When I'm with the um, what about More, when you're in the neighborhood yeah, and in the you're neighborhood. not sure if they're progressive or not? And I think I try to find the common ground issues if nobody wants to be in fear of, um, of losing your home or having the business that you've been going to for decades to be closed down because of a new condo building being built um, on top of it. But I think it's, um, I try to find where people are at. But I also try to challenge um, and push back on conservatism, whether it's people trying to push the homeless out of parks at night or other issues. But I try to frame it in, um, in compassionate talk, not trying to demonize people's fears. But I think that that's one of the um, lessons I've learned is I try to find the common ground with people that I'm dealing with. Sometimes they might not agree with me on a social justice issue, but they might agree on an economic justice issue, for example, um, but um, I think if I'm in a more progressive district, for example, with different organizations, my language changes, but um, at the Board of Supervisors, though, we have an opportunity to push back on conservative ideology and um, with policies, so I think when we make our remarks, I think it's really important to, to counter um, the dehumanization, the racism, sexism, homophobia that are put out there. But even the, um, the trickle-down economics of Supervisor Campos in a great editorial that I believe was a joint process for their office laid out just all the basic economic arguments. But if you don't demonize the people that you're arguing against, but you lay out really rational um, and humanize people, I think there's more of a common ground to build bigger, bigger alliances even on the west side as well. There's a lot of specific um, positions. I don't think Eric has time to go through right now, but I'll give them to you so you can your office um, can answer them because it's um, 
we're talking about a more broader um, discussion here and not just, uh, we're talking about a broader discussion here and um, we're trying to kind of think kind of strategically and on a, a bare level, um, not about specific issues. Um, let's see. But I think what we can do is move on to our next uh, panelist, and then I'll save these for the Q&A afterwards. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Nate Albee is a progressive political consultant and current legislative aide to Supervisor Campos. Uh, he's a past president of the Heart and Milk Club and he believes that the progressive values of organizing and community are the building blocks for successful campaigns. Um, Nate will be talking to us about winning vote by mail and the realities of political fundraising. Thank you so much for having me. Um, but yeah, so we've been, you know, we've been thinking about losing and what it means to be a loser. And one of the things that's interesting about politics is it's a, you know, an up or down. It's a winner or a loser. So that often makes us start to think a little wonky about how campaigns went or strategy that campaign, strategies that campaigns use. People who win, we might think that everything they did was good. Or people who lose, we might have a tendency to think that everything they did was bad. So we've been thinking about how can we take this loss and turn it into something positive. What can we, what can we learn and, and pass on um, to the progressives who are coming up next? And what are new strategies that we can try? So you know, from these internal conversations, we've come up with a few ideas. So first off, just the first slide uh, is a pie chart that shows that we, we, you know, we lost by uh, with 49% of the vote, which is a very painful slice of pie to eat, right? Um, very, very humble slice of pie there. Um, we also, uh, if you look at the, um, if you're looking at the, the breakdown, and all other people have already talked about this, but well, we lost, you know, pretty significantly with vote by mail. We won pretty significantly on um, on election day, and this is a trend that's been happening with progressives for a while now. We've been talking about it for a long time now, but yet it still keeps happening to us. And if you may think that we might have, as a campaign, gone in knowing perfectly well that we have an absentee problem as progressives and did nothing about it. We didn't. We had a strategy that we tried, um, which was a neighborhood focused, uh, going out early, talking to folks who we identified as likely voters, and unfortunately that strategy didn't work. So, you know, we're, we're trying to think of new ways that we can, uh, new ways that we can, you know, deal with our, our vote by mail problem. Okay, so most progressive districts. So, does anybody know what the most progressive districts in San Francisco are? So nine is one of them. Five. Six is one of them. Five is one of them. Eight, eight is no longer one of them. Okay. Uh, so eight, five, six, nine, and then I'm sorry, ten is the last one, right? And does anyone know which uh, precincts are least likely to vote absentee? Here we go. So uh, we can see right here that you know we're just moving right along, chugging along, becoming more and more vote by mail. Anybody who isn't thinking that we're going to have to be running almost entirely vote by mail programs like in the next election, should probably think otherwise. Next slide. This is that painful pie that I'm talking about right here. 49.51, next slide. This is our vote by uh, mail. So Chu did significantly better than us. Next slide. That's a pie I like a lot more, but it's not enough to win, right? So this is our, this is our polling, uh, polling pie. Next slide. So most progressive districts. So you guys all got them, D9, D5, D10, and D6. Uh, so this is the next slide is, what is the most least likely to vote absentee? Next slide. Oh, sorry, yeah, there we go. So yeah, exactly the same. Um, so that's one of our problems that we're really looking at here that no one's really talking about. The progressive districts aren't registered to be absentee voters. So how do, how do we deal with that as a movement? How do, we, how do we go forward? And one of the things that we've been doing is we've been asking our candidates to deal with it in the middle of the election. So we're telling people, all right, like, uh, you need to run your normal campaign, you need to deal with media, you need to deal with volunteers, you need to raise a ton of money, which we'll talk about later. And then also you need to be registering people to do vote by mail. So that's just not gonna work. We're never gonna, we're never gonna win unless we start thinking about it on the off election years. So, 
who are the people that we need as a movement to sign up to be uh, vote by mailers? Right there. So this is this is the this is the voter base. The reason why Chinese isn't on here, um, but Chinese is obviously a huge part of any strategy, is because they are uh, predominantly signed up to be vote by mail already. So the Chinese community has done a fantastic job of making this happen, and we have so many lessons to learn from what they did, right? So one of the problems that we're, what we've been thinking about with how do, you, how, do you, how do you sign these people up? So if I am going to knock on a door, if I'm trying to emulate the Chinese method, if I'm, if I'm going to go and talk to somebody, we know that if your last name is Chinese, about 80% likelihood that you're actually going to identify as Chinese. We don't know who these people are or where they are. That's a real problem with, with the progressive movement right now. So African American, there's no common last name. We actually uh, don't know from any data who you are. Latino, you can have a Latino last name, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to identify as a Latino, which was a real problem that our campaign had when trying to reach out to Latino voters. LGBT people, if anybody knows a way to identify, I would like to know. I can work with them. Uh, and then tenants, right? Uh, and tenants, uh, how, you know, also, that's one that we have a lot more information on. But to be useful for vote by mail, we need to know tenants who are going to stay living where they are, right? For a long, for a long time. And that's something that we're going to have to work on too. And then the other piece of this that is, is, is important is you need to be LGBT and be progressive. So one of the lessons we learned from this last election was being queer doesn't mean you're going to vote for the queer candidate anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, we got the, when we did polls, we did well with LGBT people who were liberal and progressive, but moderates went for David Chu. So interesting, interesting thing that we all have to start thinking about in the future. So next, next slide. Okay, so that's supposed to be another been circle there. Uh, but so we're talking, in our office we've been talking about what are the strategies, and we've kind of come up with two sets of things that we think the community needs to start talking about. So one is, you know, organizing solutions. So the Venn diagram, diagram kind of works in you know, three ways here. And also if you're looking at what the Chinese uh, community has done to uh, get people signed up as absentee, it's not monolithic, they've done lots of different things, uh, but we've kind of broken it down into three things. So one is we need to ID who our people are. So there needs to be some sort of in-between campaign structure or, or movement or program or you know, people are talking about the progressive voter project or maybe the liberal voter project is a more appropriate term now. But it's people who are knocking on doors and saying, hi, I'm with the Democratic you know, voter sign you up project. Um, do you identify as Latino, white, Asian, Filipino, marking that down? Do you identify as liberal, progressive, moderate? Do you identify as LGBT, uh, straight, by collecting that data? Oh my gosh, one minute left. Collecting that, do I get a, do I get a little more because of my, yeah. my nightmare? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, you know, so uh, actually asking those questions and then collecting that data and then re giving it and using it during elections. We also need to be, of course, registry, registering people. That should, any part of any progressive movement, that's something that we should be doing, is getting out there, finding our folks who are disenfranchised and signing them up. And the third thing is, we need to be turning out those people who we have already identified, already know who they are, and, we, and, and, uh, and, and getting them to, to vote. So all of these things need to happen in between elections, and they need to be a, everyone coming together to make that happen. No single group can do this. Next slide. Um, these are some of the electoral things that we have been tossing around and we want to kind of present and start a discussion on. And there's lots to talk about. So one of the first things, um, and this is happening right now, there's a debate happening in uh, LA County about moving elections. So I personally believe, and there's definitely certain sets of data to talk about this, that the mayor's office is going to be out of reach for us until we move it to a presidential election here. So having a discussion about is it worth it, and this is what they're talking about in LA right now, to say give Ed Lee one more year to actually have the next mayor's race happen in 2020. Uh, that's something we can talk about. Um, all of those, all, all of those uh, happening on a presidential election year will of course make things more progressive, and then other options we can have if we move them. So Swiss voting. Uh, the Swiss style is everybody gets an absentee ballot mailed to them, and then they can do one of two things. They can go and drop it off at a polling place, or they can mail it back. So that's something that Supervisor Combos has been talking about that we're uh, thinking might be something that the progressive movement wants to start talking about to put on the ballot for 2016. 
Another idea is neighborhood voting. So uh, I know at some point in the past, Willie Brown somehow sneakily got uh, one neighborhood voting in a section that he was interested in getting more votes on. But what that would look like was rather than just having City Hall the entire month, we actually said for every neighborhood, there's a place where you can vote any day, every day, you know, as, as, as much as we possibly can for a full month for people to drop off those Swiss ballots. And if we're not doing the Swiss ballots, just go and vote. Uh, next thing is uh, uh, the Seattle model, or the, or the Washington State model, all vote by mail. Do we start thinking about this, if, we're, if this is the trend, and we know this is, is the trend of getting more and more vote by mail, should we just, should we need to suffer in this period where our people aren't the people that are signed up for vote by mail and therefore aren't voting? Or should we just pull the trigger and sign up everybody to vote by mail? That's another conversation we can have. Hey, let's talk about fundraising before we yes. run out of time. Okay. Uh, and also, a public advocate like New York had to actually start talking about some of these issues. Might be something to insert in the dialogue. Last slide. Uh, fundraising. So this is our fundraising, kind of broken down for you guys. So we, uh, we broke the record for most spent on an assembly campaign, except for one other person, who was David Chu. <laughs> so this was, I mean, this is, if you look at how much money was spent, as my grandma used to say, this is a shit ton of money, right? <laughs> like, this is crazy. Um, and where this, well, you're going to break down by vote, she ended up spending $47 per vote, we ended up spending $32. You know, he had to, we made him work for it, we made him work for it here. This is really important to face and face the reality of. Um, Does that include IEs? This is IEs included, so you can see the IEs are broken down, and then our IEs are broken down over there. You know, labor was really there for us, the nurses were there for us, SF Rising just did the most amazing thing any, any candidate could possibly want. But, you know, we didn't compete. They had a million dollars more than us. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is the trends we're starting to look at for supervisor races. So, in 2008, um, you know, Chu was the only one that started to raise a significant amount of money. Everyone else run, uh, won by raising what would be a moderate amount of money. Then you get to 2010, and you have Wiener and Farrell are, you know, through the roof. They're doing almost half a million campaigns. Mm -hmm. Then you get to 2012, we're starting to raise even more, and then Cohen, um, you know, is almost a, uh, you know, 400,000 herself. So if you look at the top six people who've raised the most in supervisor races, only one of them is a progressive, and that's Supervisor Mar. Uh, and Chu, the only, he, other people didn't even identify. So the red are people who considered themselves moderates when they were running. Chu, I would say probably, you know, I don't think we can call him a progressive anymore. Uh, so. We have to start thinking about raising money that it, it, as progressives before we had this idea that we could use uh, knocking on doors that would make it so we didn't have to raise money. I think because of Citizens United, those days are over, and we have to start really, as a movement, thinking about that money is also part of what we have to give. So who gave, who gave to Supervisor Compost in the last race? Okay. So if everybody in this room I mean, and maybe some of you guys weren't supporting, but if everyone in this room had given $100, we're really starting to cook the fire there, right? So progressives have to kind of switch their mentality of money is also something we give as well as our time, as, as something I think, yeah. Uh, that's it, I think. Is that my last slide? Cool. for everyone to uh, be patient with our technical difficulties. This is a community meeting, so that those things happen. Um, and I think that was our last PowerPoint, too. So we're going to stay seated. All right. OK. So um, uh, there's been a lot of, as usually the case with these things, uh, there's been a lot of comments that aren't really questions. But I'll try and summarize um, some things. Um, so, uh, bringing up the fundraising um, aspect, um, there's a lot of people who are um, less fortunate. And um, so when they see money thro being thrown around in campaigns like that, you know, there's just really, I get more comments and questions. Um, but um, they don't really like, um, you know, all that money as well as losing, given all that money. Um, so maybe if you can address um, some of their concerns. Uh, sorry, I'm 
much. So people don't like money being spent on losers. Is that, is that what we're getting at? Gotcha. Um, well, that's. <laughs> so sorry. Again, I apologize. For um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think that's pretty cynical to tell you. That's a pretty cynical comment. Uh, you know, if if maybe we'd had a little bit more money, we could have won, right? Um, who 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 knows? And I think money in politics is one of the worst part of politics. I think money being taken out of politics is really the answer to ending corruption in politics. But the reality is, right now. Um, they're kicking our ass, and they're raising more money, and we won't, we'll continue to lose unless we start taking that seriously. Um, so along uh, those lines, um, how much of an influence were, um, was, we talked about tech voters being not that much of an impact in this particular election, but what about tech money? I mean, if, if, if Ron Conway and Reed, uh, and Reed Hoffman, who put in a million themselves, you know, that's that extra million, hadn't done that, then we would have won, for sure. Um, we don't even feel that the Mayor Karimi vote, which is what a lot of people were talking about, really hampered us that much. And that it was, it was the extra million dollars that got spent against us. Um, as, the, as far as the tech vote, too, I, I do think it, it seems like it's looming and it's scary, but I also. I also want us to you know, stop and think about like, what, who identifies as, as a tech person? And are they going to vote along the lines of as a tech person? And you know, my partner is, works in tech, I have a lot of friends who work in tech, and I, I, don't, want to give, I don't want to give up this extra 10,000 that, that Professor Cook is talking about. I think that we have more in common with them, with them than not, and we need to find, like, we need to find, you know, a lot of those people are gay, so do they identify as gay, or do they identify as tech? A lot of those people are Chinese, or Filipino, or lots of other, uh, Identities. Those are who we need to be reaching out to and, and bringing to our side. I agree. Um, and one more question. Um, this has come up in different contexts, so not just about um, the Congress campaign, but the question about insiders and outsiders. I know it's not really a, quest, uh, a question in both the, some of the different instances that I've had, um, but I guess some people are feeling like they're left out. Mm. I mean, uh, being left out of the concept of progressive, is that, or from campaigns? Um, from campaigns, and, but also the concept of progressive. So, uh, I think that we, the word progressive, you know, we may be better suited to do what Supervisor Marr is doing and, and use it a little bit more selectively. I'm trying to use the word li reclaim liberal and take that back. Um, but I also identify as myself as a progressive, and so it's it's and it's something I take pride in. So it's hard to it's hard to shift that. And I can see why people are troubled. As far as being involved in campaigns, um, best way to get involved is to walk in the door. Uh, we we could have used you. All right. So let's move on to our next speaker, Emily Lee. Emily Lee is a leader of San Francisco. Um, Rising Action Fund, a 501c4 organization whose mission is to build the political power and voice of working class communities of color in San Francisco. Emily's experience in leadership development, political education, and organizing. Recently, she played a key role in running a citywide community labor independent expenditure to elect David Compos for assembly, raise the minimum wage, and protect affordable housing. Emily is a recognized leader in electoral organizing with particular expertise in multiracial alliance building, community labor partnerships, volunteer engagement, multilingual field operations, and ethnic media. So we're very happy to have her here. Um, Emily will be talking about how we engage and organize within communities with, uh, within communities with an eye towards long-term investment. Thank you. Y'all hear me? Um, so, hey everyone, good evening. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to have this conversation. I feel like this, there's been so many questions um, that we've been grappling with in our organizations, um, in our you know volunteer spaces, and places where we're actually trying to say, how do we keep San Francisco for the communities who built it, right? The communities who are working here every day, who are teaching our kids, who are the ones out there keeping it running, right? Um, and for myself, as part of SF Rising Action Fund, um, and also our sister organization, San Francisco Rising Alliance, which is a C3 that has um, eight other grassroots organizations who are part of it, 
um, including Poder, MOA, uh, CPA, Casa Justa, Just Cause, and Power, which recently just merged. Um, Coleman, I see Kevin back there. <laughs> Shout out to Coleman. Um, the Day Labor Program, the Women's Collective, Filipino Community Center, as well as um, South of Market Community Action Network. You know, our communities have come together because we're fighting, you know, for our families to be able to have an opportunity to stay in San Francisco, right? Um, I think, you know, it's really important as folks are talking about the way that San Francisco is changing. How do we look at what does that mean for us? But also, you know, especially on this thing around the fundraising tip, I think, you know, we're never going to have enough money. You know, we're never going to outspend the other side, right? Because that's just the reality. So I think it's, in some ways, it's like it's good to recognize the way new tech money is playing in elections, but also that our strategy is never going to be just about raising as much money as they do, right? And um, I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, and also that, as Eric was pointing out in his 2012 election, um, you know, you were outspent. <laughs> you know, it was a billion dollars. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it, it it wasn't just about the money. It was actually about what was the multi. Um, multiple levels of strategy that we did to win that district race, right? And to keep that district um, progressive. So I feel like I learned a lot. That's kind of where I really learned about, you know, how do we run elections in uh, campaigns in San Francisco um, when the odds are against you, right? The odds are stacked against you. Um, and that it's still possible for a progressive movement to win. Um, and Eric was joking, I think, saying that this, is, this side is the hopeful side. <laughs> um, but his election was, a reality call that, hey, if we want to win, it means we have to throw down in new ways, right, and try new strategies. Um, and I think my main point on this panel is really about, you know, if we want to, we have to really invest in the community if we want to win the voting block. It's not just about winning that vote, it's about how do we win over that community, right? And I think that's the strength of organizations like SF Rising because, you know, Diana asked this question at the beginning and she said, you know, what do we do about the progressive movement when there isn't an election looming? And that says a lot about the state of the progressive movement if we need to, if we don't know the answer to that question, which is organize, right? So I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the organizations that we represent, we're the ones interacting with the community and voters year round. It's not just about an election cycle, right? Um, and I think we can't take working class communities for granted. Right? We can't take them for granted. Um, we need a sophisticated strategy. We have to win. You know, I hate to use military reference metaphors, but you know, it's like the air, the air um, war as well as the ground. You know, it's like we need to win it. We have to do it all. Okay. So right, it's not just about door knocking, but it's about what's the kind of sophisticated, um, really uh, robust communication strategy that we have to be uh, dedicating to these voters, um, and it has to be informed by uh, organizers who are on the ground. And I think that's part of what people are saying is, is the progressive movement out of touch with people, right? That's some of the questions that have come up is, yeah, can progressives relate to regular people who don't identify as progressives, but who probably care about being able to stay in their homes and being able to keep their kids in the school district, right? Um, I think it's, and that's kind of where it, it comes to play that you need good organizers, right? You need people who are skilled in that um, to be able to, you know, get that message Right? So that we're not just talking to each other all the time and using that same lingo. Um, and I feel like, you know, the Prop G campaign, like, um, you know, Maria always tells me this um, stat about how actually in the 2015, there's been how many LSAC evictions so far? Zero. Zero. Uh, less than three. Less than three LSAC evictions, right? We're at the end of February. Right? Why did that happen? You know, it was because of Prop G and the fight that was started in, you know, 2013 for that. So I think it's really important that we don't take Prop G, also that, that loss at the polls to mean that it didn't have an impact, because it clearly does, because it's on the forefront of the conversation in San Francisco, and developers and landlords are scared, you know? If, if they know that if there's going to be an LSAC eviction, there's going to be people who are going to mobilize around it. Um, and I think the other side around Prop G is that, you know, we moved a lot of Chinese voters over with very little resources. Um, and it still wasn't enough to counter the other side's lies and propaganda. Um, but, and you know, just because we would have assumed that, well, if you're a tenant or you're a working class person, like you, would, you should vote for G, right? Um, but the reality is, is that the other side is, you know, they're competing for those votes too. And um, they were spreading a lot of fear and confusion in the community. Uh, and far less were on our side than should have been, even just based on their own pure self-interest, right? Um, but I think it is, you know, folks did move, you know, um, 
recent, you know, the polls that were done in the Chinese community around Prop G, at first um, there was, the first poll that they did was actually saying it was 29% support, and by the end it moved up to like over 50%, right? So that's a huge way that we actually saw that people can be moved, right? Um, and I think particularly in the, um, the independent expenditure that we worked on um, uh, as SF Rising Action Fund along with our labor um, and other community partners, um, Families for an Affordable, San Francisco, we found that the combination we used of field and communication strategy really um, actually resulted in um, a big increase in terms of low propensity voters. So uh, the district, uh, or the, yeah, the assembly district, um, um, number of low propensity voters was 24% who voted in that election, right? For our IDs that we said that they said they were gonna vote our way, it was 35%, right? So it's like we, our field campaign and our com communications campaign is able to actually turn um, those low propensity voters, it makes a difference, right? So I don't want us to give up on the voters who are voting at the polls on the day of, right? Um, and I think the other thing is that, um, to talk a little bit about G is that, you know, how do we, we have two, two different campaigns, right? Pro-G and anti-G, telling voters the exact opposite things. Who are they supposed to believe, right? The ones, the people who have the, you know, more fancy, translated, colorful advertisement, or like, you know, mailers? You know, we saw their mailing to the Chinese community, po uh, pictures, color pictures, like, like almost like a, like a family photo album, to Chinese voters saying, these are the people who are gonna be hurt but if Prop G passes, right? So, they're, they're targeting um, our community for sure. And so how do we actually expose the other side's lies in a way where the community understands, like, oh, okay, I'm getting all this mail, but I know who's really behind it. I know who is benefiting from this, right? And I think that requires a more sophisticated communication strategy than most uh, consultant, um, you know, mainstream consultant groups are gonna wanna do, right? Eric knows we had a fight. Um, we had to fight the consultants to say, hey, actually, you should be targeting Chinese voters. You should be talking to Filipino voters, Vietnamese voters, Latino voters in your district. And we had, we basically, um, you know, got them to triple the media budget, right? So these are the things that we have to do to actually get the type of communication that's going to win people and help them understand the values and the frames that we want them to um, uh, be on our side with, right? Um, and they're not dumb, you know? It's like once you, once you understand, like, okay, who's behind this? People, people get it, too. Um, I think the other side is that we have to create more um, spokespeople who are trusted by working class communities and who, and create those mouthpieces for them. Um, you know, the other side has a lot of well-known, like, radio talk show hosts that are basically like the equivalent of um, Rush Limbaugh, you know? Um, they're out there all the time talking about they're talking against the minimum wage, against unions, against you know affordable housing, against progressive Chinese politicians <laughs> and leftists like Eric. Um, who do we have? You know, who do we have on that radio as that radio talk show host, or who do we have representing us? Um, and you know, Eric has an um, opportunity with Sing Tao uh, Daily, which is the uh, you know the newspaper that most people read in San Francisco, um, where he gets to you know write an op-ed once in a while. It's like, how do we create more opportunities like that? for progressives in, the, in those kind of ethnic media, right? In the, where they're consuming that media. Um, and I think the last point I'll just end with to have one minute is that we really have to play the long game, right? And a lot of people are saying, you know, it's, it's GOTV on October 6th now, it's not November 4th, right? But it's not even about October 6th. It's like, it's, it's way earlier than that. Investment in communities is not just two months before the election day, three months, you know, six, yeah. It's, it's about cultivating those institutions in the community who are gonna present a choice to people so they get to choose what side they're on, right? Um, yeah, and I think the main thing is just that those communications, in order for them to be, to work, they have to come from people who are on the ground talking to them, right? So we can't divorce strong organizing and strong field with like savvy communications. Um, and I guess I'll just end there. So we have a question here about um, whether you can elaborate on whether Asian Pacific Islanders vote with Latinos and African American communities. Um, which issues divide them and which issues unite them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the issue. Um, I think we can't just like kind of blanket say like, oh, all Chinese voters vote this way or all 
you know, Pacific Islander voters are, you know, uh, it's not that simple, and that's kind of the point. It's like our communities are not just, a, you know, uh, we're not all the same. Uh, and I think definitely the work of, uh, like, the Action Fund, um, which is about actually addressing working class communities of color across the spectrum on issues like Prop 47, you know, like Prop 30, it's actually about how do we unite the communities around this. Um, and, you know, I think there's some people who are saying, who are going to say, you know, Chinese, vo Chinese voters are not progressive. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not worth investing in because they're never going to go our way. And frankly, that's pretty racist. <laughs> Um, I think that there hasn't been a serious long-term investment in the Chinese community um, around organizing and assessing what's possible. You know, I think that um, we can't just uh, just give up a whole swath of people in our in our city um, and say like, okay, here you guys can have them. You know, on the other side, Ron Conway. You know, you can have our whole community. Um, and for us, you know, we really um, built um, through our work as the Chinese Progressive Association Action Fund, we've really built up, ever since 2010, when SF Rising started, we built um, 15 to 20,000 IDs of Chinese voters. Each election cycle, we're identifying them, people who we think are gonna vote our way, right? Working class Chinese people. Um, and maybe they don't vote our way every single time, but it's like, how do we, what are the experiments we're gonna try to basically get them to be more and more progressive voters consistently? Um, and that's like, that's what we're talking about, is that long-term investment of, hey, let's try some different things, let's see what can happen, right? Um, so I know that you um, went over a lot of this already, um, but maybe, because uh, there's, still, there's still some questions that were earlier and some now about um, kind of keeping the momentum in communities of color um, and not just kind of when there's a crisis or an election. Um, so maybe, think, Maybe people are wanting to have like specific examples as an individual. That may help. Yeah, I mean, I think a really great example is even the Prop J um, victory last year. I think a lot of progressives took it for granted, actually, that like, oh, you know, the mayor is supporting it, so of course it's going to pass, you know, whatever. It's not, like, let's not work on that. It's not important. It's not progressive enough, right? But the reality is that, you know, would never have been on the ballot. We wouldn't have the highest minimum wage in the country right now. Um, unless like organizations like Progressive Workers Alliance were actually waging a campaign five years ago to talk about wage theft and talk about how people aren't, get, aren't getting paid a minimum wage and can't survive in the city. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that, that type of work, that type of organizing five years ago made wage theft a you know, household name in city politics. Um, it was a national issue. It became very matter of fact that of course you would support a minimum wage increase, right? Um, but, you know, I think it's, we shouldn't dismiss all the organizing that happened um, and also the community and labor partnerships that had to come together to create the Campaign for a Fair Economy, right? Um, which was labor and community groups together. Um, and, you know, it was really like people had to struggle together, but also it wasn't just transactional, um, it was strategic, right? So I think that, you know, that is a good example of like, yeah, it's not just that one-off time, it's like what it took to get Prop J to win it so easily was five years of hard organizing, right? And like building those relationships between community groups that are, you know, worker centers, and they're the ones who, you know, domestic workers, restaurant workers, day laborers, you know, really getting them to raise um, minimum wage as an issue in the city. And then to get elected officials to basically say, oh yeah, of course we're gonna support this, of course, it's so, you know, obvious. Uh, but, you know, five years ago it wasn't obvious. Mm. So um, closing us out tonight is Maria. Uh, Maria Zamudio is an organizer with Casa Justa Just Cause. She's a um, San Francisco housing rights organizer. Her work is centered in the Mission District where she has the privilege of working with, organizing alongside, and learning from some of the most inspiring, resilient, and badass tenants fighting for their homes and the right to their neighborhood. She deeply believes in the power of organizing working class people of color to bring out the uh, to bring about the world we all know is possible and that we truly deserve. When she's not fighting slimy market rate developers and other tools of the gentrification machine, she likes to go hiking with her three-legged dog, Chuleta. <laughs> Maria will be talking to us today about some challenges and models for effective GOTV get out the vote plan for people of color.
Can y'all hear me? Cool, buenas tardes. How is everybody doing? It's a lot. We, we put you through a lot, right? Okay, I'm, I'm um, 10 more minutes. So um, I want to start off with a story. Um, maybe some of you all have seen him. Um, he's one of our lead members. His name is Don Candelario. He is a quiet, humble, 62-year-old Salvadorian man who before 2014 had not thought about the electoral system in the, in the United States at all. He actually comes with a, with a wealth of knowledge and experience running and winning campaigns in El Salvador for years. Um, but when coming to the United States, because he didn't actually get his citizenship until last year, the United States' electoral system just wasn't relevant to him. It wasn't, any, it wasn't something that he engaged with. Um, so when we, when we began talking about a ballot initiative as a way, as a tactic, to fight back the speculation that was happening in, in the mission in, in, in San Francisco, I literally saw his eyes light up. Because he was, fi he was saying, finally, our tactics are scaling up to the need that our to, to meet the, the need of our communities. Um, and he helped put together the Mission Excelsior Tenant Convention in, in November of 2013. He helped put the citywide tenant convention together in February uh, 2014. He was at every single Prop G action, and he brought you know five other members that he had turned out. Um, on a, once election season came, he was he was working um, he was working um, he was working somewhere. He was walking precincts. He was making phone calls, and um, he worked multiple 12-hour days during GOTV. Uh, and so I tell you this story. Oh, and he even tried to make sure that his citizenship process happened faster so that he could vote on November 4th. He told me, he was like, I want to vote for David Campos, and I want to vote for Prop G. It didn't happen. He got, he got his approval letter like a month afterwards, and I, I, I didn't hear the end of it. He was just like, I hate this country. <laughs> they didn't let me vote. Um, but I tell you this story because this is the kind of long-term power building in communities of color that are surprising. And Causa Justa, this is why we do electoral work, right? So we know that we need working class black, brown, and Asian leaders to, um, to be able to win the electoral field. Um, and it goes beyond just one single election cycle. And I think we've heard it multiple times. Um, it goes beyond one single candidate, one single campaign. It's a long-term process. And it needs to be coupled with rigorous community organizing when elections aren't happening. So just to give you a little background about why Causa Justa does civic engagement work um, or, or electoral work, we call it civic engagement. Um, we, we see it as a tactic, right? We see it as a tactic to be able to win back our cities um, and it's another way to build our folks' power, right? We're trying to develop leaders, we're trying to develop working class people of color's leadership who've been told time and time again that their leadership doesn't matter, that they shouldn't be leaders. We're saying, no, you actually are leaders. You have an incredible amount of power. And here is another practice ground for you to, for you to, for you to work that out on. Um, we also know that our communities don't have faith in the electoral system. We put a lot, of in, we put a lot into it, and we don't often get a lot out. Um, and it, and we also, but we also know that the electoral field is not one we're going to seed. We need to stay in that field, and we need to continue working with it um, to meet our greater goals, right? That's, that's just the reality. Um, and so for us, like I said, the civic engagement work, the electoral work, it's a tactic. It's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is a people-powered, people-of-color-led movement for progressive change that will actually eventually turn the tides in our favor. And our favor is one in which as humanity, we're actually being developed and we're being invested in instead of just kind of grinding for profits, right? So that's, that's the goal. The electoral work is just one of the tactics we get there, how we get there. So last year, Causa Justa worked incredibly hard to not only pass, but to actually develop from the ground up Prop G, the anti-speculation tax. Um, and what we learned from that campaign is that actually a strong field program is really important. Um, especially if you want to turn out uh, voters of color. So for um, the Prop G, so uh, as Prop G, we were, we were a pretty small campaign. We didn't have that much money. Um, and what we actually did was we actually worked strategically with other programs throughout the city to be able to, to put our volunteers and to put some of our capacity where it really mattered. 
And when we ran our programs, we made sure that our programs were also smart and tactical. So we, we ran fields in nine tenant heavy districts, four of them in Park Merced and five of them in the inner Richmond. When we went into those places, no one had been talking to them. In Park Merced, you, you ask people, they had no idea an election was going on until we came and talked to them. Um, in, in, the part, in, the, in the four Park Merced precincts, we ID 96% for, for G. 96% of our, of our door knocks were for G. Um, and in the inner Richmond, yeah, 96% IDs, y'all. Um, and in the inner Richmond, our, our, in, the, in the five precincts, um, our, our ID level was at 85%. In all but three of those districts, Prop G won by, by a pretty big majority. Um, and these, these precincts didn't have a lot of turnout. They were pretty low, low turnout. It was a low turnout election. You know, I'm not saying that there were thousands and thousands upon thousands of voters coming from these nine precincts, but the voters that did come out voted for G. Um, and so for us, that shows us that a, a rigorous field program during the election actually has to be a continuation of the organizing that we're all re already doing in those, in those neighborhoods, right? So the year-round investment that we're doing in communities of color. Our neighbors need to know who we are. So when I so when I knock on a door and I say, hey, my name is Maria. I'm from Causa Justa. I'm here to talk to you about Prop G. They know who I am. They know who Causa Justa is. And they, they, there's a level of trust when talking to a Latino voter about, a, about electoral work, right? There needs to be a way in which we're building trust with our communities. Um, and the reality is that, like Nate said, black and Latino voters tend to be progressive if they vote. If they vote, that's the thing, right? So we need to make sure our job is to push back on actually a really long history of disenfranchisement in our communities. Um, and because of this kind of parachute style electoral work, which none of us do, right? None of us believe in that. Um, there's actually a lot of mistrust around the voting, of, around elect elections um, and, the, and the electoral system. So year round investment in the necessary, in the fights that are actually agitating our communities and in the things our folks care about, like on, a day, on, the, on the daily, that's the stuff that's gonna get our folks out to vote um, during the elections. Um, and, and, and by history of disenfranchisement, I wanna talk to us a little bit about why Don Cande has been a registered, a, a registered resident, has had his green card, has been a resident in the United States 1995, but it wasn't until 2014 that he got his citizenship, right? So we need to start, we, um, at, at Garza Houston and at the Rising, we talk about growing electoral power, and we also talk about growing the electorate. We need to get more black and Latino voters registered, registered early, registered as vote by mail, but we just need to get them registered. We need to get Latino voters to register as citizens which again is going against that idea that um, the electoral system is one in which we don't trust. Um, so yeah, we need to grow it and turn them out. Um, and that means, like I said, a deep investment in long, in, um, and it's not just a deep investment overall throughout the year, but it's also an investment in rigorous field programs, right? So we need to actually invest I'm sorry. It's really frustrating. So we need to actually invest in the kind of field programs that are actually going to turn our folks out. That means um, they are they are as resourced as the media plan. They are as resourced as the mailings. We make sure that our our, our door knockers are trained um, and know what to do and know where they're going and know how to talk to folks, right? How many of you have knocked on the door for the first time ever? Maybe some of you don't remember. Do y'all remember your first time knocking on a door? Yeah. It was so scary. I was, I was 15 years old when I first knocked on a door. Um, and I was shaking. I was like a chihuahua. <laughs> um, but as I did it, more and more, it became, it, I, it became powerful, right? Um, so the only, the, in the last minute that I have, in the last, oh God. I want to talk to you about uh, San Francisco Rising and kind of building a long-term coalition to win. So San Francisco Rising is part of a statewide organization called California Calls, 
who is building political power to overturn Prop 13. It's not a small feat, it's going to take us a really long time, but we've been actually making uh, inroads in that. We, we supported and helped pass Prop 30 a couple years ago, and last year, in the election in 2014, we actually passed Proposition 47, which is helping decriminalize California and moving people out of jails and funding into schools and other types of supportive services so people don't go to jail. That's the kind of that's the kind of long-term vision and that that and, and the kind of political power that we're building statewide to be able to get those women. Uh, turning, uh, Getting rid of Prop 13 is going to take a long time, but if you do a protract protracted effort over time, you build that political power. We're doing that in, um, through California Calls, and we're also doing that locally in SF Rising. Since 2012, SF Rising has built a 17,000 supportive um, voter base through rigorous field program. We do that through rigorous field program um, because that's, that's how we're going to win, right? Um, what else do you want to talk about? Oh, the, the last thing. Oh, I have to Okay, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> make sure something gets overturned, you have a team to, to, to kind of roll with, right? Elections, at the end of the day, are about numbers, and so is organizing. I can't show up, I can't show up at a board of supervisors meeting and want something to pass if it's just me and Grande. And we've, we've done that before. <laughs> and it passes, but that's not, but, but that's not sustainable, right? So if you want to know one thing to do to help win progressive electoral fights, you find your neighborhood-based community organization, you find a progressive organization that you trust, that you care about, and you start organizing with them. And then when the elections come, you say, hey, we should probably go do something about that. Who wants to come register some voters with me in the Bayview? Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of questions and concerns about um, communities of color participating. Uh, I think you've You've raised a lot of them yourselves, Emily and Maria and other panelists. Um, and there is that distrust. Um, so how do you, um, in your work, um, and Emily can answer this too, break through that? <laughs> sure, I mean, I can go. One thing that we do with our members is right before any big election, so we do um, civic engagement programs every year. Actually, every year our members are doing some sort of electoral work, and that's through our Kelly Calls Coalition, the California Calls, right? Um, and again, it's practice. Our members are practicing what it's, what being in the electoral uh, field looks like and how that works. Um, but before we do any major CEP program, that's what we call them, because um, it's really hard to be like, okay, so five hours on a Sunday, see you there. It's really hard, right? Um, uh, especially if it's multiple Sundays in a row, but what we do is we actually start with a history of, of, of where the right to vote came from. So we talk to our folks, so this is what happened, this is what we vote, this is where things kind of went sour for people of color, and, um, and then we, we kind of, again, talk about it as a tactic. It's not our goal, this is not the only thing that we do. Electoral work is not our, our it's not even our bread and butter, right? What we do is we actually stop displacement, um, make sure our immigrants are, are living with dignity in our cities, um, and and fight for, for, for human dignity. That's kind of what we do. And our members recognize that. I think I would just add on, like for us, um, it's really important to talk about what grassroots leadership looks like and leadership development, because 
the thing about, you know, a lot of our organizations that we've been around for 10 plus years, mm -hmm. many of us have been around for, you know, 30, 40 years. So we have like a strong base of leaders who actually are the best ambassadors and messengers mm -hmm. to the rest of the community yeah. about why they should vote progressive. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. our folks are actually already been trained through all these different fights to talk about like, yeah, why progressive taxation makes sense. You know, most people hate, don't want to touch a tax issue, right? Mm -hmm. But like our folks can actually tell people, yeah, this is why, because it goes to funding our education and our services. And I think it's also about um, developing leaders who aren't just going to be like, oh, just vote for that person because they're Chinese or because they're Latino or because they're, you know, because they're queer, you know? So it's like, you know, not just based on identity politics, but how do you actually put the value in front? So there's also a question, um, and maybe we'll just have this directed to Eric and uh, Nate. Um, there's a question about, you know, the mayoral race this year and there not being a high profile candidate anyway that um, is really opposing Mary Is this a, a missed opportunity for the progressive community? Yeah, I think when Newsom ran a few years ago, um, we had the Progressive Convention, and there was hope. But actually, Amy, Amy Farrell Weiss is here, who's also running for mayor. But I think it is a big point that um, there's not a, um, a strong um, labor back or progressive back person right now. But I know that um, as um, elections go forward, hopefully the grassroots organizations will challenge the positions of the mayor and to try to expose more of where he's not um, standing strong for um, real, as I think Joseph Smook from People Power Media, the amount of affordable housing that needs to be built and a lot of the policies that he's proposing um, are very moderate um, and hopefully people will challenge those policies as he promotes his 2015 re-election. But I, I sense that people realize that pouring resources into a losing campaign might be wasteful instead of building up the um, infrastructure and grassroots forces that we need as well. Yeah, I, I agree exactly with Supervisor Mar. I do think we need to have a protest candidate, somebody to get out there and spread the message and ask questions of, of the mayor and kind of help frame what our discussion is going to be in 2016. Uh, yeah. So, it's not my poll, but if you look at the polling of mayor, he's at 60% approval. Strong approval is at 12 to 15%. <laughs> I mean, this support is this thin. So it is a huge, astronomical missed opportunity that there is not a serious candidate. I'm serious. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, not well That's the wrong word. That's the wrong yeah, word. But, but, a, but, a, but a candidate with an opportunity to have a real debate with the mayor, well, he will actually be forced to engage in these questions. Because he will not engage in these questions as he did not engage in these questions four years ago. Mm -hmm. right? But the thin support is unreal to me that we have somehow interpreted 60% approval, 12% strong approval, as somehow inevitable, is flatly beyond me. Eric Mars, mayor. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would turn that again to the campaigns. That, that to me is the, um, among the many challenges, right, is that candidates are, in campaigns, are IDing voters, they're connecting voters, and there is not, and oftentimes, to me, a lot of what happened in this election was um, the progressives were split. G, K, compost, um, minimum wage, um, and then the candidates don't, the campaigns don't necessarily work together, they don't share data, we may ID voters for one campaign and not for another, we don't protect the data, and then you reinvent the wheel every couple of years. The other, the other side maintains the data, just to be frank. So, I mean, again, that, that has to be done at the campaign level, that, that, that level of infrastructure building, um, candidate recruitment, we need to be identifying it today. Um, Progressive women of color in particular with kids in public schools in particular running for school board in 2016 and 2018. Now, today, we need to identify those candidates. We need to build, you need to build a bench so you're not left with candidates running for mayor who may have run for mayor a few times back. Um, who have an ability to mobilize support in the community. 
Um, but it comes down to how do campaigns work with each other? How do electeds work with each other? Um, just one, one quick thing, just because I like being a nerd. Um, so ballot measure strategies are not, a, are, those are not sustainable. No votes always win, right? I mean, being on the yes side on, on ballot campaigns is very, very difficult. No is privileged, particularly when no has like $9 million. It's particularly privileged, right? So a ballot measure campaign is not a sustainable one, going up against big money, because people are inclined to vote now. Particularly in local balloting, when they've already voted on like 50 other things, they vote more and more no as they go down the ballot, right? They vote more and more for the incumbent as they go down the ballot. Research shows the longer the ballot, the more they vote no. The longer the ballot, the more they vote for incumbents. If you're an incumbent, you want to be at the bottom of the ballot. If you're a challenger, you want to be at the top of the ballot, right? So ballot measure campaigns are not the strategy. Being on the yes side of ballot measure campaigns, particularly against, against big money, right? So we have to be figuring out how we do this sort of long-term, as everyone has also said, long-term strategies to mobilize in communities, candidate recruitments, we're identifying candidates who will be running for mayor four years from now. We have to really be thinking about this in a long-term, much more integrated approach than we have. Um, and there has been a couple questions about money. So um, this one says specifically for you, Nate, how can we compete against billionaires, but also for the rest of the panelists, um, how do we sustain this, um, you know, everyday approach kind of to engaging our audience. And, and exactly what Emily said is we, we don't need to compete with billionaires. We need to compete, uh, we need to have enough money to get our messaging out there, that's all. And when we start to get too underwater, so when there starts to be a huge imbalance, that's where it becomes very, very difficult to climb up that hill. So we have to be we have to, you know, be somewhat competitive, but we don't have to win. It's never, we're never going to raise more money. We don't even want to raise more money. We're always going to focus more on our people and turning out folks and knocking on doors. But, you know, we, we did raise a million dollars. So we, we've raised more than any progressive ever had. And I'll tell you the secret. <laughs> it, it, there was not. It was, <laughs> it was just, it was just small little strategies. It was, just, it was like when I asked everyone to raise their hand, that's how we did it. Uh, everyone, we had we had people really deep down, you know, dig deep and give, um, and that's a lot to ask from our community who is not a wealthy community. But um, that's what we're, that's what you know that's what's gonna that's what it's gonna take to to be at least somewhat better. I'll just say also, I mean, look at what voters in Richmond just did. Look what voters in Berkeley just did, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you yeah. can mobilize against big money campaigns yes. because they are big money campaigns. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, so, talking about related to that turnout, how do we increase turnout? And we've talked about, you know, we've had some diagrams. We've talked about um, participating in the community. Um, what are some things that we can do to increase turnout in our base? Sure, um, I think this goes back to a little bit of what Nate was saying, and it's like we just have to have um, a serious conversation about vote by mail and early voting, right? Emily always says this. Um, she said this to me during the elections the whole time because I was freaking out about our turnout numbers. Um, and, and Emily always says there is just no way we're going to turn out the thousands of IDs our, 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 our campaigns get, because we ID thousands of people. There's just no way we're going to get all those people out on November 4th. It's impossible. It's, unless, unless you're Obama and, you are, are you, and you're running a 100-person team at every single minute of November 4th, there's no way we're going to turn out the thousands of IDs that we have. So that means that we need, as, as black and Latino voters, we need, to, we need to get our registration game on. We need to get our folks registered. We need to get our folks registered early. Um, we, need to, we need to make sure that we're on those doors talking to our folks early, right? I talked about the, how important field operations are. Field operations are just as important when we're doing early, early vote and vote by mail. That just means we just have to get out or have conversations with our neighbors. And like Emily was saying, our members are the best ambassadors. You all are probably the best ambassadors to talk to your neighbors about early voting. You get your ballot, you knock on all the doors in your apartment building, and you say, hey, Lanyana, did you get your ballot? I got my ballot, you want to work on it together? That's actually how we do it at Gosa Justa. Our folks come in through a member meeting, and we fill out our ballots together. We don't fill out for candidates, because we can't. 
But we talk about but we talk about the propositions and we go through different ballots together and so we do it as a community. Just like we just like we organize for campaigns, just like we organize to get big wins, just like we organize to make sure people stay in their homes and we show up fifty people deep in front of a house so that our folk doesn't so that our person doesn't get taken out by the sheriff. We need to do that. We need to take that model that we're so good at and kind of translate it to the electoral one. I was just going to add that Corey and I were just talking about ballot initiatives, and sometimes when they're developed by the grassroots movements and strategically placed on the ballot, Ted Gullickson was a master at that, turning out tenants with um, pro-tenant measures that are framed pop, you know, in a populist way, so it's not just the east side, but it's also west side voters that are going for that. It's another way to do that as well. Yeah. So I'm just going to add that Lydia's point about you know how do we do it early. It's like, that takes resources, right? It takes resources to actually turn people out early and to register, register them early. Um, and, you know, that's like a much uh, longer investment than most people who donate to campaigns are willing to do. So it's like, where do we get the resources to do that kind of like year-round organizing, like we would say? And also the, like the, your point that you made around, you know, folks just, they've been, they could register to be a citizen, but they haven't done it for 10 years. You know, that's a much bigger campaign to wage around kind of shifting the way people view voting in a community, right? Like, that's a big project. You know, that's not a six-month thing. That's, like, that's years, right, of, like, turning things around and getting people to understand why it's so important for them to vote and what's at stake, you know? So I just feel like there's, um, there's that resource question about, you know, investment. You know, it's not always it's about people power, but it's also about what does it take, you know, the resources. Last thing to add to that, because I think it's really important. I think that we need to build an organization that is directly focused on electoral politics, that is a progressive organization. I think that's that that we we're so good at our community development, but part of being a progressive is being suspicious of electoral politics, <laughs> rightfully so, we all should be. But there needs to be somebody who is holding down that fort throughout, you know, on the off cycles who is leading us in the right direction and, and raising that money that she's talking about, getting that resources and, and doing the work. Okay. And so for, thank you so much for everybody for sticking around. <laughs> that, we still have got one, one more question. Thank you for your participation. Um, but, but I think this is an important one. We're talking about um, who's on the bench not we're not going to name names, but how do we build that bench of progressive electoral candidates? Um, and just really quick, everybody, talk about that. <laughs> um, we got to keep people in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We got to make sure that our homegrown leaders who have gone to school here, who are invested in in this in the city and in their neighborhoods, get to stay. So anytime you get an email about an eviction fight. Should go, because that person might be your next mayor. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the thing about politics is that you never want the person who really wants to run to run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always want the folks who are like, they come, you know, they don't do it from a place of like, I just want to, yeah. you know, have power. It's like, you know, how many folks had to get pushed, right, yeah. to run? Yeah, yeah. And how do we get those homegrown leaders who come from the community and understand the issues and are not just out for the, you know, whatever, glory or being out there for power, you know, it's like, that's the bench we have to build, because there is a bench. There is a bench it's that there. exists, it's but it's not the there. type of bench yeah. we want, yeah. right? So it's like, the bench we want is actually different, right? So I think that's a, that's a longer conversation. And I, I, I actually, I actually said there is a bench there, and it is the bench we want. It's just getting those people to run. So like, like Emily should be, we should be all be trying to get Emily to run. We should all be trying to get Maria to run. Like, these are the people who've been doing this work, and we should be trying to talk that conversation about running. And that's the. We'll run your <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add that the most humble people generally are not going to be the first to jump in, and we should be encouraging those that have the experience and. Um, those that are the most enthusiastic about running, I think we should be extremely suspicious of. Um, the DCCC is another place that in the 90s, many of us worked on the Alliance for District Elections that changed um, the way we elect supervisors that, um, that made major changes. We had to build up to that. I was on the DCCC in 96. You have to hold your nose and deal with the bullshit of the Democratic Party. But it's still really, really important. And right now, we're getting our asses kicked even worse 
in the DCCC, so some of us are still meeting to talk about how that is, but hopefully there are people from the east side and the west side that are thinking about the DCCC in addition to Community College Board, School Board, and other races as well. All right, thank you so much.